Good morning. My name is Tom Coffing, and I have been teaching classes for 30 years on all database platforms. Taught about a thousand classes. I've written 85 books on all systems. Because of the classroom knowledge of the expertise in these systems, I was able to be the leader of Team Nexus, which I think is the greatest software ever built to query all systems, migrate data between any two systems, and be able to do federated queries. And we're doing 30 table joins across 30 systems, and I'm very proud of all that. Today, you're going to see something extremely exciting. If you've ever been afraid of analytics, I'm going to show you the top four ordered analytics, and you're going to really have a great understanding of those. Thank you for coming. I'm excited that you're here. We're going to start with the row number. The row number analytic is going to show you the fundamentals of how all these analytics work. Notice I'm selecting the product ID, sale date, daily sales, but then you see row number. That will be the analytic function we want to perform. At first, it seems really simple, but it's going to get very powerful. Now, you'll see row number, open paren, close paren. There's never anything inside the row number, but it is a function. After that, you will always see the word over on all ordered analytics because everything we do is going to be over an ordered set of data. So the first thing that happens when you run this query, they go, how should we sort that data? And they go, well, it says order by product ID and sale date. And that's exactly what happens. We order by the product ID and within product ID, we do the sale date. That's the major sort of product ID. And then on all ties, we will then further sort by sale date. And once the data is sorted, that's when they'll say, put the row numbers in. One, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't even look at the data. It just says first row gets a one, second row gets a two, and so on. And that's the basics of the row number. But what I want you to get out of this is, before any ordered analytic happens, they look at the order by, and that's how they sort the data first. And then the calculations happen. Watch very carefully. If you put a partition by just in front of the order by, I put them on two different lines up there. But if you do that, then this will reset. The partition by means group this in partitions. So it says, well, here's the product ID 1000. And then it sorts the data first by product ID, since that's the partition. And then within product ID, sale date, order by sale date. And then it goes, oh, they want me to reset on each product ID break with that partition statement. They go, yes. So now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They go, I've got a new product ID, 2000. They go, start over, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a partition by in conjunction with the order by resets the data. The partition by is part of the sort. We're, we're partitioning by product ID and then ordering by sale date. It's a little like saying order by product ID and sale date, but I also want it partition. So that's why we have the partition by product ID, which is really kind of the first sort. And then within that, we'll order by sale date, but we reset. Now, on Snowflake and Teradata systems, they actually have a qualify statement where after the totals are calculated, they come in and they go, hey, you want to qualify this start over, which is the alias for our row number, and you only want the top three rows in each? And they go, yes, I only want qualify start over less than four. And it goes, okay, I'll give you the one, two, three, the one, two, three, and the one, two, three, four product ID 3000. Now, there's an easy workaround if you're not using the qualify statement on all systems. Now look at this. I'm going to do it two ways. I just put parens around my query. And you can see everything in blue is part of a derived table. This is the width version. There's two versions of a derived table, basically. And I say with Nexus, that's my derived table name, as open paren. Then you can see the blue close paren down below. So it actually runs the query in the black there first to get me all of the things that you see here, but it's one to seven, one to seven, one to seven on the start over. And then it's putting it in a derived table called Nexus, where we then say, select everything from Nexus, which is the derived table name, where start over is less than four. 
And now I'm going to order that and I get the same exact result I got up here with the qualify. But I put it in a derived table. The reason this works with a derived table, any where clause, the data must already exist. It can't be a future calculation that they're saying where. But once I put this query in a derived table, it now does exist. That derived table will last until the query ends and then it's blown away. But now I can say, hey, that does exist. This is what I see one to seven, one to seven, one to seven first. And then when I put it in the derived table and I say, hey, I want to select everything from the derived table name Nexus, where the start over is less than four, they go, sure, that data already exists. I can see it in the table. And now I've got this. Here's another version you're probably more familiar with. And that is to say, hey, once again, this was our qualify start over less than four. But if we can't use qualify, I'm going to change this by saying, oh, I'll run the query. I'm going to put it in a derived table. I'll say select everything from. I'll put an open paren. I'll put a close paren. And then I'm going to give it a name. So watch this. I'm going to call this Tara Tom. And then it's going to come back and say, oh, where start over less than four, order by product ID and sale date. You see, each derived table, you have two select statements, one from your query and another to populate the derived table. You give the derived table a name, and now this where clause is going to work, and it fits like a glove. Let's go to the rank command. You know, this is a brilliant command itself. What I love about the rank command is that we can come in with a rank. And once again, we can select product ID, sale date, daily sales. Rank, open paren, close paren. There's never anything in the rank. So you almost say, well, what are we ranking? Well, once you look at the overstatement, you know we're going to order it. It's all based on the order by. I say order by daily sales ascending. And they go, oh, we're ranking daily sales? And I go, yes, in ascending mode. So it sorts the data first by daily sales ascending. And then it says, I'll put the rank in. It looks at the first two rows and goes, oh, there's a tie. Gives them both a one. And then the third row, it goes, you're a three. It's like a golf tournament. You're in third place. And then it ranks the data all the way down. Now, if I wanted to rank things higher, they go, well, what are we ranking here? I don't see anything in that open print, close print. I go, oh, look at the order by. We're ranking the data by daily sales descending. Now I see the highest rows first all the way down and that's how I'm ranking this data. At the end we have a tie with two 13s. Now if I put my partition by they go hey what are we ranking? I go well within each product ID we're ranking by daily sales descending so now it groups it. Partition by means group by in a sense for analytics. Now I'll show all my 1000s and I'll rank from highest to lowest. When we get to the 2000s, that's a different grouping. It starts over and ranks it again. The rank is a fantastic ordered analytic. Now, once again, I can say qualify. I only want to see the highest three sales per product ID. So I partition my product ID, order by daily sales descending. It does this. We saw this in a previous query, but then I say qualify the rank less than four and it goes, I will give you the top three sales per product ID. Now, as you can see here, I've got all my data, top three sales. Now, if I didn't, wasn't able to use the qualify, I just put it in a derived table. Once again, with the derived table named Teratom as I put parens around the query and I say select everything from Teratom where their rank one is less than four. And I order the data and they go, oh, how come that where clause worked here? And I go, because we put the data in a derived table and now the data exists. So we select everything from Teratom where the rank is less than four. It's so easy. Now, this is a really interesting query. This is called a cumulative sum. Most people see this and they go, this is aggregation, Tom. We're summing daily sales. I go, no, it's got an over clause, which means we're going to sort the data first, and then we're going to sum this rows unbounded proceeding. So they sort it by product ID and sale date. And once it's sorted, 
they then do the sum, rows unbounded proceeding, which I'll get to next. It says, what do we make on the first day after the sort? 48,850? Okay, that's what the cumulative sum starts with. Oh, the next day we made 54,522. Oh, the total of those two is 103,350,62. Oh, as it adds data, it just keeps adding. You could call this a running total, and you're going to be able to see how your data calculates row after row. Now, the rows unbounded proceeding, that's always a little scary because you go, what's that mean? You'll, we'll talk about a moving window or a window of rows to be calculated here in a few minutes because it's either going to say rows unbounded proceeding or rows one proceeding, two proceeding, three proceeding, four proceeding, a number. But we'll get to that. But rows unbounded proceeding really means, look, I want you to do the rows and sum them. And I want you to do unbounded. So if I've got 50 rows, do 50. If I got 100, go 100. Whatever the all the rows are, just keep doing this and add up the preceding totals. And they go, oh, I'm going to do as many rows as you present to me. That's what the unbounded means. And I'll just keep adding up the preceding sum. That's what rows unbounded preceding. So the moving window here, whatever you got. Now, I put in my partition by. That's our reset. So now, I'm going to partition by product ID, order by product ID and sale date. I didn't say need to say order by product ID and sale date. I really could have said order by sale date since I'm partitioning by product ID. But either way, you're not going to hurt yourself. And then it shows me all my 1,000s and it adds them all up. And then it gets to 2,000s. It starts over. That's the beauty of the partition by statement. Now watch this and be amazed, okay? Now I'm going to partition my product ID and order by the sale date. And there we go again. And it resets once again. Now watch this. This is really cool. I'm going to do both a subtotal and a grand total. My subtotal is going to be the first one. I'm going to sum daily sales over partition by product ID, order by sale date, rows unbound and proceeding. But since it's a partition by, it's going to start over. So if you look at the subtotal, it calculates and continues that moving sum, that or that that running total, and then it gets down to the 2000s, it starts over. But the second ordered analytic down near the bottom called grand total, it doesn't have a partition by statement, so it just adds up from the first row to the last row, and as you can see, when things break from 1000 to 2000, the subtotal starts over, but the grand total just keeps adding, and you're going to get those grand totals at the end. Now, this is the moving sum. We're going to look for trends here. Now, this says sum daily sales over order by product ID sale date, which it does the ordering first. And then it says calculate this with a moving window of three. And you say, wait, Tom, that says rows two proceeding. And I go, no, that is the current row and the two proceeding. It's a moving window of three rows. But there's outliers here. The first row says, hey, I'm going to sum 48,850. We made 48,850. And then you go, well, that's only a one row sum. And the second goes, hey, I'm going to add up 54,5 and 48,850. And I get 103, 350, 62. And I go, yes, but that's only a two row sum. Once it gets to the third row, they go, oh, this will be 36,000, 54,5 and 48,850. That does equal 139, 350, 69. From that point on, we've that point we've done three rows. From that point on, they go, what's the next one? I go, well, it's 4,200, then two preceding, 36,000, 54, 5. That's 130. The next one is 328, 40, 36. That's 109. It's always three rows after you get through the first two outliers. And that's way you can look for trends. If I was looking at this, I would say, hey, what happened with this 109? That didn't do very well. Now we need to investigate. Why did our sales drop off on that three-day period? It's really a three-row period. But since we're calculating this and getting one row per day, it's a three-day. And I go, what happened during this three days? And they go, well, we investigated it. And it was really bad weather. And people just didn't come into the store. 
And I go, well, wait a minute. Let's look at this 151 down there. What happened then? They go, oh, come on. That's when we ran that commercial nationwide. This is a really good commercial. You look for trends when you do a moving sum. It's kind of like the Dow 65-day moving average. That's what you're looking for over a 65-day average. Now, we're going to do that moving average right now. We're not going to do a 65-day moving average, which would have been row 64 proceeding. We're doing a rows 2 proceeding. Once again, three rows. First row says, well, the average is 48,850. The second says the average between 48,850 and 54,551. Those are two outliers. You can't rely on them. Those are only one and two row averages. But once we get to the third one, we go, oh, 3654 and 48, the average was 46,450. The next one does three rows too. 4,200, 36,000, 5, Oh, that is 43,566. So as we look at these three row moving averages, or in this case, a three-day moving average, we can look at this and go, oh, what happened on this 36, 333? Three, three, three? And they go, oh, I told you, that's when they had the bad weather. Well, what do they do on this 53, 580? And they go, commercial went nationwide. We really have got it together. Now, this is even better when you start to um, do some really things like partitioning. Here's once again my rows two proceeding just to show you in pink. That's the first three row value. From that point on, it's always three rows unless I partition. It makes more sense when you do the partitioning because you can check out each product ID. Once I get to the, the pink average three, that's a three-day moving average. And then each one is the same. And I can see when I did best with product one ID 1000, which is really the last day, okay, 50, 551. And the worst, we did 36, 333. And then when we go to product ID 2000, it starts over, okay? Once again, when you partition, you're going to see things reset. But I can also not partition, okay? And I can just do a moving average because I'm saying rows unbounded proceeding and it just does all those rows. This is the moving difference. Now, you'll need to be able to call on this slide to see it's daily sales minus sum of daily sales over we do our order by and we actually say rows four proceeding and four proceeding. Now look at this. I've colored this in blue. You see a lot of nulls there because what's tricky about this, when you do the four proceeding and four proceeding, it takes the current row, compares it to only one row, four rows ahead, and tells you if it was a positive or a negative difference. So where you see the very first value in MDF ANSI, it's minus 16,049.90 in blue. You go, oh, what, what happened here? I go, they said, well, in the current row, we made 32,850. Four rows ahead in blue, we made 48,850.40. If you compare only 48,850.40 and 32,800, we lost $16,000. Oh no, what happened? And then below that, we have our 64,300. We compare that with one row, four rows ahead. We compare 54,522 with 64,3. And we go, hey, we did better by 97,99. That's the way the moving difference works. It only compares two rows, the current row, and in this case, four proceeding and four proceeding, and the row four ahead of it. That's the way it is. The best moving difference is usually a seven rows proceeding. That way, if you can compare what you did on a Monday to the next Monday, Tuesday to Tuesday. And so 30 is great when you want to do monthly compares, what happened at the beginning of the first month and the second month, things of this nature. The moving difference only calculates between two rows, the current row and the one in this case, four rows proceeding. And of course I can partition by, and if it does that, then it's doing the partition by and doing it only within the partitions, in this case, product ID of 1000. And then it resets and does the 2000. These are your analytic functions. Thanks for coming.